So part of our uh, Questions to God series is the Questions to God class. Uh, where they talk about the topic of the day, and then they're invited to ask their own questions. And I, they didn't hit me too hard today. I just got three of these today. The first one is not really a question. It's a list. Uh, so I got an idea of what to do with this list. It's a list of this person wrote down favorite verses, and then they wrote down four favorite verses. I'd like to invite you to pick one of these to go read. I'm not going to read them to you. I'm just going to tell you what they are. And I'll invite you to just, just, I'll take one, right? Just, you're going to need to get a pencil or something out, or you have an incredible memory, uh, and you'll remember it, but just commit. I'll read one of those, all right? So here you go. Here's the list. Micah 6. Micah 6. That's one of your choices. The second one is, they just wrote 1 Corinthians, And I thought, that was, oh, they probably mean 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm like, nope. Why should I, lay, you know, break it down just to one chapter? Uh, so 1 Corinthians. It's not a big book. You can get through it uh, quickly, uh, 1 Corinthians. Okay, the third one they had was John, the Gospel of John. Uh, so not the ones after, or later. Uh, John chapter 16, verses 12 through 14. John chapter 16, verses 12 through 14. And then here's your last one. If you're like, I only want to read one verse, you're in luck. They picked one. It's Psalm 143, verse 8. Psalm 143, verse 8. So there's your choices. You got a whole chapter, Micah 6. You got a whole book, 1 Corinthians. You got John chapter 16, 12 through 14. Or you got Psalm 143, 8. So I hope you'll take one of those and just read it today. Why not, right? Now, questions. Let's see. I right, take this in an order. All right. Well, I'll just take it as it is. The first one. Do we need to read about the Bible as much as we need to read the Bible? That's an interesting question. Sometimes it's hard to understand what's in the Bible without some kind of guide, some type of assistance. So... Uh, do we need to read about the Bible as much as we need to read the Bible? Um, no. Okay, next question. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I, here's what, I say no because read the Bible. Just read the Bible. And sometimes we'll read everything but the Bible. We'll read about the Bible. We'll watch a video about the Bible. We'll read a commentary, or we'll read a, a, a devotional book, you know, but um, I, sometimes it's good, just read the Bible, and then when you get confused about something, let your curiosity take you to go read about the Bible, but um, that's just my quick answer. You should focus on the Bible, but it's good to get those helps, certainly. Then the last one, how do I use the Bible to guide my life? Oh yeah, this should just take a couple seconds. Um, how do I use the Bible to guide my life? I think it's... I know that when I was younger, I expected the Bible to be like this kind of like, uh, like an instruction booklet, you know? And I just would have to like find the right page and it would tell me how to handle each one of these situations. But really, what the Bible does is the Bible tells you about God and about you in relationship to this God. That's it. And so, understanding who God is and understanding who you are in relationship with God, that should guide your life. But it's more like the Bible, I think, is meant to shape your understanding of who you are, who God is, and how all that works. And then from that understanding, your life is guided. But it's not so much like, gosh, what am I going to do on Tuesday? I don't know. Let's check out Leviticus 4. You know, like it's, it's more like you let it shape you. And then what will come out of you naturally is a reflection of what you, how you've let it shape you. That's what I think on that one. Instruction booklets are uh, an interesting analogy. I... Um, I recently got a, a wonderful gift from my children. It was for Christmas. And they got me 
uh, a Nespresso coffee machine. I don't know if any of you have this thing. Like, I had a Keurig. And I, like, if you're like, well, what's the difference? It's like if a Keurig was even better. Okay, it's like, it's similar. You put these little pods in, you clamp it down, you press the button, and it, mat there's, I don't know, there's magic inside of it. It's voodoo magic, something. But it comes out this just delicious coffee, and it creates this like little foam on top, the way it makes the coffee. It's just delicious. I found out the other day that if you take a cranberry orange scone, and you just dip it in the coffee foam, and then eat that, that is like, mm, that's what heaven's like, people. I'm just letting you know. Um, so, uh, but it's wonderful. But, so I've been trying to, uh, I use it every day uh, now. I mean, I, I, I love it. And uh, so, but the other day I tried to use it. I clamped it down, put the little thing across, and the little button comes up and it's white. You know, it starts shining white. You press that, and then it starts up. And then it starts to make coffee. But this day when I did it, I pressed a little button, and it went, and then it stopped. And then the little white light on top turned red and started blinking very quickly. Now, I don't know how it does the voodoo magic it does inside. You know, I, I, it's like a car. Like, I don't know how the car works, but if anything is red and blinking fast, that's not good. That's not like, hey, you want $100. It's more like, ah, you're going to spend $1,000. Uh, so, but it's blinking quick, and, and, and I'm like, okay, what is this? Now, keep in mind, right below the coffee machine is the drawer where we keep all of the manuals. So everything we have in our kitchen, you just jam the manual in that drawer. It's right there. Did I open it up and look at it? No! I'm a modern-day self-sufficient guy. And so I just kind of like, well, maybe if I just open it up and close it and try again. And it went... And it looked like it was going to work. It turned white. The, it turned, oh, good. And it went, rah, 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 and then, bing, 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 red light. I did that four times. <laughs> and then I did what I do with my computer. I just turned it off and unplugged it and weighed, weighed about 20 seconds. I don't know why I thought, like, the coffee machine is like a router or something, like, you know, and, and I just clear that out and plug that back in. And I uh, started it up, rah, 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 and then, bing, 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 bing. So uh, I finally gave in opened up the drawer, pulled it out, and went to the troubleshooting. And it said, if there's a white light that's blinking, you know, it means this. Okay, all right. If there's an orange light that's blinking, it means this. If the orange light is blinking twice and then pauses for five seconds, then it means this. If it blinks once, and then and it, it went all these different, and I'm like, there's no orange light. I'm flimming through it. And it's like, there was nothing in there about a red light blinking. Hmm. So I did what anyone else to do. I went to Google. Okay, Google, I asked. Found out there were like 10 different answers for what could be going on if there's a fast blinking red light. But it seemed like three people all agreed that it had uh, something to do with the water tank not being hooked in. Okay, fine. Take the water tank out, put it back in. It worked. Miracle of miracles. So then I went back to that instruction booklet. And I looked at it, and it said... Sure enough, there's is the thing that says, oh, the water tank isn't hooked in correctly. It says, when the orange light is blinking rapidly, that means that's, and then I realized something. Whoever wrote this thinks that color's orange. <laughs> I think this is very similar to our experience with the Bible in that, like, whoever wrote that thing doesn't think the way you and I think today. You go in looking for the answer to one thing, and you can't seem to find it exactly. And to them, they just saw the world differently. I also think it's much like instruction booklet, because we'll do anything not to actually open that thing up and use it. You know, the Bible is a lot like software license agreements, you know? You have to say that you read it, but no one actually does. But it's right there in front of us. And so the big question today that we have in our Questions of God series is, is the Bible reliable? And I'll tell you, when I saw this as the question for the week, I thought to myself, reliable for what? What do you mean by that? You know, last week when we talked about the who is God, we talked a little bit about, like, you know, does God even exist? And then we went into the character of God. This one made me think also of a different kind of question, like, is it reliable? You mean, like, is it actually the Bible? 
Is it actually what was written down? Is it actually the original words? Because a lot of, um, I've heard this before. Well, you know, you can't trust the Bible because it's been translated so many times, it's probably not even like what the original Bible was anything like. Well, let me tell you a little bit about how your Bible came together. Because I think for a lot of us, we just think like, a long time ago, some really old person sat down and wrote a lot. And wrote a Bible. Actually, what happened was, is that your Old Testament was written over a thousand year period. Some believe that the oldest parts of the beginning of the Old Testament were written somewhere around maybe 1300 B.C. And then, over the course of time, things were written. No one was trying to write a Bible. They're writing down what they had received, the law from God. And then they started to write down the stories around how that was received and what happened. The stories that had been passed down orally. All those years of interacting with God was not done with a written Bible. It was done just through orally telling stories. And then people started to write things down. And then as the prophets, you know, received a prophecy, they would proclaim that and they would and write that down. And then the story around it would be written a little later. But basically, you have the books of the Old Testament were gradually written separately across that 1300 to about 400 B.C. Now, nobody put those things together and said, this is, this is the, uh, the Old Testament or this is the Hebrew Bible until several hundred years after Jesus' death. It's just a bunch of scrolls and a bunch of writings. Now, they would have them together, and, and, a, and a temple would have these writings together, but it's not, um, it's not this bound book like you would find now. They believe there was a lot of holy writings, but certainly the law, those first five books, that was treasured, and then there were specific prophets that were treasured and wisdom writings. So they had these, like, collection of things. Now, with your New Testament, so that, that Old Testament was written in Hebrew, by the way, um, in the New Testament, um, you know, Jesus comes, lives. And they say, oh, Jesus is coming back. And then after a while, they realized, you know, maybe he's not coming back next week. And we need to, like, lock down some of these stories so people know. So, uh, so what you've got there is in the beginning of your New Testament is just four preachers who all just wrote down the story of Jesus. They're not the only people to write this, these gospels. It's just the four that people seem to find most useful. The first one uh, that was written out of the ones we have is Mark. That was probably done about, say, 10, 20 years after Jesus died. And then about 10, 20 years after that, you've got Matthew and Luke who wrote, they're like, okay, that's good, but there, there's some other stories being told, and Mark didn't include them, so I'm going to add some more to that. So Matthew and Luke wrote their own little versions. And then about 20 years after that, you've got John who's like, well, there's even other stories to tell about Jesus that are not being told, so I wrote those down. And so, like I said, lots of people wrote Gospels, but these were the four that people actually found useful, that were read out loud uh, and shared with others and copied. Now, while all this Gospel writing is going on, um, before any of that, your earliest stuff is the letters of Paul. So the rest of your New Testament, again, Paul wasn't trying to write a Bible. Some people are like shocked when you actually go and read the New Testament, you realize this is a letter to somebody. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 they weren't trying to give instruction. They were just, uh, you know, generic instruction. They were actually giving instruction to a specific church. So you got letters sent to the Corinthians, letters sent, you know, over to Thessalonians. And, and so these letters, people would keep them. And they'd go, well, this is pretty good. This letter we got from Paul, this is pretty good. And then someone would visit their church from another city. And they'd go, we're going to read this out loud again. And they'd read it out loud. And they'd go, oh, that's good. Can I get a copy of that? Sure. So somebody would copy it. And then they'd take it to there. And pretty soon... There was a collection of Paul's letters that seemed pretty popular, and people were copying them. And so then, a couple hundred years later, someone decides, we got to lock this down as to what is the official, the official thing. And all they did was they looked at the ones that people were using, and they said, That's, this is the ones that people find useful. So, like, there's, there's a whole other version of Revelations, and they're like, the Revelation of Peter and it's, that's just crazy. They got upside down burning crosses, and it's just. So you think Revelation is crazy? There's one that was too crazy, and it got kicked out. Uh, um, but they decided. It, they just said it wasn't useful. It just confused people. So, the Bible that we have together is just what was found to be useful in the working of the faith in the New Testament. 
And so they, they took those Old Testament writings, New Testament, and the, for the longest time, the oldest copy that we had of the scriptures was all in Greek. We didn't have an old, old copy in the original Hebrew. And, and, and so you're, you're getting around 300s, 400s, and, and we're putting together these writings. In fact, the oldest copy for the longest time that we had of the Hebrew scriptures actually in the Hebrew was like from like 900 A.D., 900,000 A.D., so it's, it's almost a thousand years after Christ's death. That was the oldest copy of the scriptures that, uh, Hebrew scriptures that we had. Then, back in the 50s, somebody was throwing a rock, and it went into a cave, and it broke a clay jar. And they went up, and they found inside some very, very old copies of the Hebrew Bible in the original Hebrew. And they dated them back to 200 B.C., so over a thousand years earlier, and they compared those old writings to the latest one they had, and even though there's a thousand year span, it was like 95%, 97% exactly the same word for word. That's pretty amazing. There's not a lot of, of, of writings that survive in that type of environment, but they were so particular about that, about making sure that the word of the Lord was preserved. So in some sense, the answer to the question, is it reliable, is like, well, it seems like we've done a very good job of keeping record of it. It's at least, it's in, of all the religious texts, the New Testament in particular is the closest to the time that the events actually happened, of other religions as well. Those New Testament writings are closest to the time it happened. So pretty reliable in the sense of like, this is what was intended, what was passed along. It's not muddied too much by translations and such. But what I think is the juicier question is, is the Bible reliable for guiding you in your life? Is the Bible reliable for those main purposes that we talked about, for knowing about God? Here's my simple answer to that question. What else are you going to pick? I mean, if not the Bible, what? What's, what, what's going to be your, your, your great source for knowing God? A lot of people will do anything but read the basic instruction book. They'll Google about the Bible. They'll read a book about the Bible, but never actually read the Bible. They, 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 or they'll say, like, you know, what's really clarified, like, my life is this book that was written just last year. So, Here's the thing. We've got a book that was written over thousands of years ago that has successfully guided people in their lives. And people worked very hard to preserve it. And they got it all the way to now. And you're going to prefer a book that was just written last year by some dude who, like, grew up in Oklahoma? I mean... Anything but the actual book itself seems to get the attention of folks. Now, I do want to throw a caveat in here, and this is something you probably won't hear from many preachers. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to read your Bible to be a Christian. You really don't. You do realize that, like, very few people read the Bible up until the 1500s, Right? I mean, we weren't like translating the common language and printing it and sharing with people. Most people did not have a copy of the Bible. For the majority of time that Christianity has been around, people did not have copies of the Bible. People weren't reading the Bible. So it must be able to survive and have an influence in people's lives. There must be a way to be Christian without the Bible in your hand that you read. This is the moment where a lot of people will just check out, like, he just said I didn't have to read it. He said I didn't have to read it. It's true. But you see, what they did instead was they gathered together and they listened to the priest and the preachers read from that Bible and tell them what was in it and then guide their lives by that telling of it and receiving of it. And in the households, the stories would be told. They would talk about it on a regular basis from what they had heard. 
So really, nowadays, you've got two choices. You can read the Bible or just do whatever I tell you. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, there's... Sometimes, like, I, I think that we, we get this kind of complicated view of what the Bible is, and, and it's complicated, but it's often not correct. It has a complex history. It's put together over many, many centuries and there's lots of other writings that happen, but these are the writings that seem to have been able to really genuinely help people that's reliable because it has actually worked in the guiding of civilizations, in the guiding of people's lives. It's actually worked. You have it. It's in the drawer at home. It's on the shelf. Read it. Why would you not? You live in the privileged era when you can have access to the Word of God. But we don't. And that's a shame. More often what we do is we just, we pick pieces out of it that we think is useful. Now sometimes they're lovely things that, you know, can carry us through our day and guide us and it's good to read, but often we misrepresent the Bible. Too often, the way the Bible is used turns off people from ever reading it or encountering it or wanting to become Christian at all. I, I saw this uh, video. Uh, see, I watch videos too. Uh, I, this video of uh, uh, people who were protesting uh, at a school. And they said, we need to get the Bible back in school. We gotta get the Bible. We should have the Bible back in school. And while we're at it, while we get that book in, here's the list of books that we should take out. There's all these books that we need to ban from the schools. The kids shouldn't be reading it. And the guy who was interviewing them said, well, uh, so you definitely, you know, uh, there's certain books that shouldn't be in there. Absolutely. He says, did you know that right now in your child's school, there's a book, and in it there's a story of two daughters who get their dad drunk and then lay with him and have babies from him. And they go, that's disgusting and terrible. Yeah, that's in the school right now. Well, that should be taken out. Yeah, the problem is that's the Bible. That's in the Bible. So, someone at the earlier service thought it was funny that, that uh, they have a, a, a daily uh, podcast of reading the Bible, and it's marked explicit material. <laughs> yeah. So, if you knew your Bible, you'd know how to use it. <laughs> and you wouldn't just wield it when you wanted to use it to attack others. There's much more press time of where people are using the Bible to attack than using the Bible to love. So here's the thing. It's reliable, but you can make it seem unreliable by what you do with it and by how you represent it. So there's a couple important things for us to carry then from all this. One is that uh, your Bible is reliable and it needs your attention because you need it to understand who you are and who God is. And without it, I'm not really sure you've got a better source. I can't imagine a better source than something that's worked for thousands of years. The second thing is that whatever you encounter in there, be careful with it. Because the way you present it to others will shape the way they receive it or that they might reject it. I think those are the two important things we need to think about with our Bible. One, we have to encounter it some way. No, you don't have to read it, but you've got to get an encounter with it. We made it 1,500 years without people reading the Bible, but they listened to it. They adhered to it. They were dedicated in communities of following it. Now we have this advantage that we can read it. Why wouldn't we? And the second, like I said, just be careful with it. Make sure that you use it to love God and to love others. That's the whole purpose of it. With that, God just might be glorified in our encounters with his holy word. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen.